Assalamu alaikum jamia wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and thank you guys for joining us for this week's tafsir of uh, Dua Kumel and it's been a minute since all of us have been together so inshallah we're moving into another part of the Dua and just like the other parts of the du'a, we find something very, very beautiful going on. And that is that in this session, everything that we begin with right now is Allahumma kfili yat danu balati. And in this one, is tun zilu nikam. Assalamu alaikum. Which is, in English, O oh Allah, forgive me the sins that bring down adversities. What are we, what are we referring to as adversities? What, what is an adversity? Say again. Hardship. We say hardship is an adversity. What else is an adversity? Anything that's difficult. Uh, anything that's difficult. Anything that is difficult. So, here we're talking, we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do what for us? To, give, for, to forgive us for all the sins that will put us in very bad situations. Now there are a lot of sins in this world. Does anyone know any of the sins that may possibly bring down adversity on us? Drinking alcohol. Drinking alcohol. Gambling. Poor diets. Poor diets. Gambling. Gambling. Now remember the alcohol, the gambling, all of these things were in last week's and the week before's tafsir. So we're talking about different sins now. And in fact, there we've been given nine. Nine sins that bring down adversities. And just for the uh, sake of time, I'll give you what those nine sins are, inshallah. The first sin is the sin of rebellion. The second sin is violating people's rights. Now that one is very, very big because how many different rights are there over us? Just on the people side. We have the, the rights of the parents. The rights of the parents. The, the rights of the neighbor. The teacher. The rights of the teacher. The children. The rights of the children. The rights of the neighbor. The rights of the, the wayfarer, the rights of the orphan, the rights of the neighbor that are near, and the rights of the neighbor that are far. The rights of the womb relatives. The rights of the womb relatives. All of these rights come into, into, um, into the scope when we're talking about violating people's rights. So when we, think of, when we think something is wrong, what if we violate the rights of our neighbors because we say we don't like this person? What happens to us? We bring down adversity on who? Ourselves. The third, mocking Allah's servants. We can answer that one too. The fourth, one of them that all of us have a problem with at times, breaking promises. Why? Because all Muslims know that there's inshallah and then there's inshallah. You know the difference. We know the difference. Someone asks you to do something, you have no intentions on doing it. Do you promise? Oh, yes, brother, I promise. Inshallah. Had my fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. But this doesn't work. Because if you don't have the intention to do it in the first place, why well, say inshallah? You should explain to that person, inshallah, brother, if I have the time. Inshallah, brother, if, if, 
I have the means to do this thing that you're asking me to do, then I will do it, inshallah. But to break one's promise does what? Brings down adversity on us. When we think about how, why we have so many bad things in our lives, this is why. Because we do these bad things. Number five is evident wrongdoing. Or when you just outright do wrong and you don't have any shame. Shame is not a bad thing. Shame is actually a very, very good thing. Shame is powerful. And it's powerful because if you have shame in doing something with our sisters, if you have shame in not wearing hijab, then you'll always wear hijab. The brothers, if you have shame, you'll lower your gaze. I know some of you guys, you look at the, uh, you, 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 you remind yourself of the hadith, well, you know the prophet said I could get one look, <laughs> and you're like, and in your mind you're taking these mental pictures, kish, kish, kish. <laughs> everybody's posing, you know, and it's like, okay, I'll go back to my mental Rolodex, why? <laughs> because I liked what I saw. So again, we can't just sit there and gawk at people and do things like that, evident wrongdoing. The sixth one, very important. And I know that no one in here is guilty of it, but spreading lies. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was asked, which group of people will be the most populous in the hellfire? He said, those who are the kadhab or the liar. So, again, lying is something that, um, that we have to look at and take note of so that um, we would always, always be in the right. And... Number seven, judgment in contrast to Allah's rules. How deep is that? What happens is, those of us, we sit down and we see our situations and we say, you know what? Well, it's okay that I do something that's wrong because I live in the West. For example, I'll give you something very, very simple. Well, you know, halal meat is so expensive, and Red Lobster has a, has a special on steaks. Oh, <laughs> salmon steaks. Hula Hands has special on steaks, and you know, I can't get to the halal, but I made an A today, so I deserve some great A steak. Some steak. Right and it's not halal, but I'm going to do it anyway. Why? Because I deserve it. But Allah says very simple things. And I just made that example because the obvious example becomes between men and women. The interactions that we have between one another that are not sanctioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially being here on a college campus, you see how this thing comes into effect all the time. What type of a judgment are we going to make? Are we going to decide that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to do is right? Or are we going to do what we think is right? Inshallah. I pray that all of you guys remember not to do what it is that you think is right to do. The next one is not paying zakah. Now let me ask you guys a question. Zakah. What do you pay zakah on? Zakah of your percentage of your income. He says a percentage of your income as zakah. What do you pay zakah on? What is it that... Giving to the poor. This is what it is. But what is it that is obligatory for you to pay the zakat, which is the religious tax, what do you pay it on? Homes is something different. It's, um, maybe I just don't get the question. Okay. 
Zakat. What you reap, right? From the what do you pay Zakat on? What is it that you own or that you bring in? Gold. Gold. Bam. You pay Zakat on gold. <laughs> what else? Um, savings. Yeah, savings. Nope. No, no, not savings. Um, carbs. No. Wheat. Wheat. Yeah, that's it. It's carbs. Livestock. Minerals. Oh yeah, that's true. This is zakat. There's differences in schools of thought on what it is that you pay zakat on. Uh huh. So how does that work for us living here? Because yeah. you know, conveniently back. Right, in right, absolutely. Country, for right, us, some countries. for us. What 95% of the hum all Muslims pay in this country and other places is zakat of sadaqa. Which means that you're given alms, A-L-M-S, that you're given to the poor. You're helping people out. Why? Because most of us don't have farms. Most of us don't mine minerals. Most of us aren't finding any treasures. Most of us don't have any, you know, gold and things like that for... In some of our communities, your communities. Oh yeah, that's true. A lot of people get gold for gifts. Mm -hmm. You get gold for gifts, or you buy gold and you don't give it as a gift, and you have money left over at the end of the year, then you have to pay homes on this gold. So, when they talk about zakah here, they're actually talking about you not giving the poor rate. Let that be understood. Because we aren't farmers, we aren't herders and things like that. So it is the poor rate. And finally, is given short measure. In this business, in the business worlds that we deal with, deal in today, you find where people made investments. They put their life savings into something. And when it's time for them re to retire, they don't even get out what they invested. Or if you get in business with someone and you sell someone something and you tell them that it's worth this amount, but it's only worth this amount, you're given short measure. So you're thinking, I'm making more money but what are you actually doing? You're committing a sin that brings down Adversity. adversities. Absolutely. What is the rebellion? In the Quran, we find where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given people certain things for us to have. And the only thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do is obey and worship Him. That's it. Allah gives us everything. We don't have to come to this world and worry about anything. We don't have to think about air. Food has been provided for us. Water has been provided for us. We have to refine the water because we messed up the water. We have to use air pure purifiers because we messed up the air. But when we got here, everything was pure. There was nothing wrong with anything, and on, the only thing that Allah SWT asked us to do is praise and worship Him. He's given us everything. So, how do we become rebellious? We rebel against what Allah SWT has told us to do. Simple things. In the Quran, we find that one part of rebellion is corruption and wrongdoing. And we find that Moses, Musa alayhi salam, he had a cousin by the name of Korah. And Korah did what to Musa? He oppressed him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? Of oppression. That there's nothing worse than oppression. But the worst type of oppression is actually the worship of false deity, the worship of false religion. But... So if you're rebellious, how are you rebellious? You oppress those people who don't have a way to be strong for themselves. I see worried faces. Confused? Confused. How is um, 
How is the worship of false deities a highest form of oppression? Because you're, you're oppressing yourself. Because you're now committing what? Shirk. Shirk. Can shirk be forgiven? No. no. So when you commit shirk, what happens to you? You go to hell. What's more oppressive than you doing the things to yourself to make you go to hell? Not only that, but when you worship false deities and you think it's right, then you begin to do what? Propagate what it is that you believe. And when you propagate false beliefs, then you're doing what to the people? You're inviting them to shirk, which is what? Oppression. You can't escape it. When we don't live our lifestyles the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to live our lives. When we think that we could go out and make money in ways that is not halal or permissible, then we're doing what? Not only are we oppressing ourselves, but we too now are oppressing our families. Why? Because they eat from it. Because they are eating from monies that were taken in a bad way. So when we look out and we're saying, you know, Ya Allah, why aren't you blessing me? What's really going on here? Well, did we do things to show that we were being rebels against Allah by not following what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us? And the first, the, first, um, the first thing we learn that our responsibility is towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Tawheed. To believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from that, everything else goes. We find in the hadith from Imam Jafar as Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam. He says that there are six traits that a believer does not have. And when he has, when the, when the believer does not have these six traits, what he's showing is, is that he is not a rebel. He's showing that he is truly a believer. He says that a believer does not have weakness and incompetence, stinginess, obstinacy, lying, jealousy, and violation of other people's rights. This is deep. Because in order to be strong, you have to do Amr bil ma'aruf and nahi no munkar. Yes. Can we get a definition on obstinance? <sighs> obstinance? Yeah, um, that, that's escaping me too, a little bit. Um, we'll cover later. Huh? Come back to it later. No, obstinance is, is actually, um, what is the best definition for obstinance? Mm -hmm. What? Refrain? Speak up. No, that's abstinence. That's abstinence. abstinence. Yeah, that's abstinence. That's not <laughs> abstinence. It's, it's, it's the same meaning of obtuse. It's being... It's bent. Huh? It's unnecessarily obtuse. Obtuse is like... Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's being... i sure. Yeah, right. It's just, you know... Being halt, halty, standoffish, stand up, mm, Unnecess not necessarily. unnecessarily standoffish. You're right, arrogant, mm -hmm. stubborn. I'm not gonna change my ways. Okay. This is this is obstinance. <laughs> the next one is violation of people's rights. Okay. Now, as the, as the as the mother and the father. We're going to move through this pretty quickly because um, we're not going to go through all of these tonight, inshallah, but we're going to pick back up on it because it's a very vast subject. But when we talk about violation of rights, other people's rights, many people are married. How many husbands actually know the rights of the wife? How many wives actually know the rights of the husband? 
and how many people are actually living those rights or trying to live those rights not only that but you know it's so simple but one of the things that a lot of the husbands do as a right of the wife where they're not treating the right the, the wife right is is that if you come home and the man wants to have halal relations with his wife our prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam he says that if the husband does not do something to help the wife get into the mood that he has violated his wife's rights you know we as men Enough said. We don't even have to discuss it. We don't have to discuss it at all. We ready. Always ready. Huh? No, never mind. What happened? <laughs> what? <laughs> don't, don't be putting brothers on the spot like that. Stop for a lot. <laughs> but we as men, we're always ready. But our wives aren't necessarily always ready. They want to perform their duty towards us, but how many of us have actually help them to become as ready as we are. That's a violation of your right of your wife's rights. The rights of the of the parents over the children. Now, in this country, we we have this saying where or we have this terminology being grown which simply means that I am now an adult. When you become an adult, the the rights that your parents have over you are they some kind of way now taken away? No. no. Those rights are rights that they will continue, continue to have forever. So when your wife, I mean when your mother or your father asks something of you, as long as it's not going against Islam, what are you supposed to do? Obey. Obey it. Now, let me ask you guys a question. If your parents are non-believers and they ask you to do something like take them to the grocery store buy them some food and things like that even though they're non-believers they're atheists can you tell them no? no, no of course not the Quran doesn't, say, doesn't indicate whether they are Muslim or not just to be obedient to your parents you have to be obedient to your parents children and you know you have kids? Yeah, we lay the law down. That's our, that's the, our only rights to the children is to lay down the law. <laughs> no, this isn't true. Um, I'll, as parents, we have to maintain you. But our first maintenance is to do what? To educate you. And the first thing that we educate you about is what? Islam. Islam. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad al Rasulullah, Aliyun, Waliullah. As parents, if we don't teach our children this, then we've done what? We've done an, adjustment, I mean, an injustice to them. So we have violated your rights. If the children scream at the parents like they've lost their minds, <laughs> Have the children kept their rights to their parents? Of course not. They violated the rights of the parent. So when the children are catching all types of bad things in their life, <clears throat> all types of bad things in their <laughs> lives, you understand it because you have violated the rights of your parents. The right of your neighbor. Your neighbor has so many rights. So many rights, so much so that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, he said that the neighbor has so many rights that I feared that the neighbors would actually inherit from us, from you. You know, in inheritance, the more people that you have that's closer to your kin, that's still around, the least that goes outside of those people because you're supposed to observe what? Salatul Rahim. 
your family relations, your womb relations, those people that come from your mother and your father, your wife, your offspring. These people are very, very important. But all of this, if you don't follow that, then what are you actually doing? You are not given those rights to those people. That means that the teacher has a right. The students have a right. The employer, the employee have rights. The custodians have a right. Everybody has a right. And if you want your life to go good, if you want everything to flow in a good way for you, then you have to observe everybody's rights, regardless of whether they're Muslim or not, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the day of Qiyamah, on the day of standing, the day of judgment, He's not going to ask you, how did you treat my Muslims? He's going to ask you, how did you treat my servants? And how did you treat my creation? It doesn't matter whether the person is doing what's right or what's wrong in your eyes or in your opinion. We have to do what? As they say now. We have to stay in our lane and make sure that we do the things that we're supposed to do. And it doesn't matter whether another person is doing what's right or was wrong. Because of that, I ask all of you, and I and I beg all of you, what we'll do after um, we start mixing this in, there's a book called Rasalatul Hakuk, The Treatise on Rights by Imam Zain al -Abidin. And in this book, not only does he talk about the rights of people, relationships, but he talks about the right of your tongue the right of your ears, the right of your body parts, the right of your eyes, the right of your belly, because all of these things have what? Right so do you. So inshallah, we're in tonight. I think um, we've gone a good little bit. And uh, inshallah, we'll pick up next week and we'll begin with mocking the law's servants and we'll go as far as we could possibly go then. But uh, if there's...